Good evening. Um, I am so pleased to see so many people here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Randy Silverman. I'm the head of preservation here at the Marriott Library. And I'd like to welcome you um, to this celebration of a publication that occurred 500 years ago, which is Andre, and Andreas Vesalius's remarkable Renaissance book, De Humanae Corporis Fabrica, or On the Fabric of the Human Body. Assembled tonight are five members of the university's academic community to address Vesalius's Fabrica from multiple disciplines in lightning rounds. Our goal is to flesh out why Vesalius's work remains relevant to contemporary scholars in both the sciences and humanities. Born in Brussels in 1514, Vesalius's father and grandfather and great-grandfather were all trained medical professionals. His grandfather was royal physician to the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I, and his father served as Maximilian's apothecary. At age 14, Vesalius began his education at the University of Louvain near Brussels. The following year, his father was appointed personal valet to the new Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, which inspired Vesalius to rethink his career and pursue military studies. Relocating to Paris, he spent three years studying at the University of Paris, but when hostilities broke out between the Holy Roman Empire and France, he returned home. Vesalius then attended the University of Padua in Italy and completed his medical studies. Mere days after graduation, in 1537, the University of Padua appointed him professor of surgery. Vesalius was 23 years old. For five years, Vesalius taught surgical theory and anatomy at the University of Padua. He wrote, illustrated, and published three original works and edited several translations of Galen's books. He also wrote the text for the Fabrica and worked closely with one or more unidentified artists to create the most detailed and lifelike anatomical renderings ever seen. The work includes extraordinary accomplishments. For example, unnoticed until 1902, the background scenery from the 14 muscle men woodblocks form a contiguous image documenting the countryside of Padua. Each full page muscle man was separated by pages of text, which may explain why it took over 350 years to discover the subtle and brown groundbreaking inclusion. In 1542, the 28-year-old Vesalius packed his 600 plus pages of text and over 200 woodcut illustrations and transported them to Basel, Switzerland to be printed. This is noteworthy. Padua, where Vesalius lived and taught, was only 25 miles from Venice, one of the greatest printing centers in Europe and the source of the great artists and woodcutters responsible for creating the Fabrica's images. The distance from Padua to Basel is 350 miles, 14 times further than Venice, and fraught with the problem of navigating a steep mountain pass only accessible by wagon in the summer. His desire to work with the great humanist printer, Johannes Operinus, whom you'll learn about in the next talk. It was highly unusual in the Renaissance to include so many pictures in a published book, but these were no ordinary pictures. The Fabrica's images were not only among the finest examples of Renaissance woodblock printing, they are also a testament to the craftsmanship of the artists and engravers. Although the people who accomplished this work were largely uncredited, scholars attribute at least some of the drawings to Jan van Kalker, a student of Titian's who worked with Vesalius on an earlier project. The quality of the drawings, their transfer to individual woodblocks, and the cutting of the blocks quadrupled the cost of the project and resulted in an extremely hefty price tag for prospective buyers. The high quality of the paper also drove up the cost of the Fabrica. 
Mid-16th century European papermaking was at its apex when both editions of the Fabrica were printed. The process of making Renaissance book paper began by collecting rags in the form of discarded clothing made from hemp, flax, and cotton. The rags were sorted by grade based on fiber quality and then fermented or retted a crucial step in manufacturing the finest European handmade book papers. Redding helped create the unique feel, look, and handle of early handmade papers. The redded rags were well washed in clear, fresh river water, cut into small pieces, and beaten back into raw fiber for pulp. The rags were macerated in troughs by water-powered stampers, and the fiber was moved through several troughs as the pul pulping process progressed. The resultant pulp, or stuff, was diluted in the vat with more clear, fresh water to the proper consistency. The vat man formed each sheet to the required thickness on a rectangular wooden frame called a mold. The ability to gauge sheet thickness during production was done by feel and perfected over many years of practice. The raw sheets were interleaved between papermakers' felts in a standing press and squeezed, and then loft dried. The air dried paper was then re wetted in warm gelatin sizing made from boiled hooves and horns. Sizing is applied to surface coat the paper so printing ink doesn't feather or bleed when it's printed. The freshly sized sheets were loft dried a second time. The process produce paper that remains physically durable and chemically stable nearly 500 years after its manufacture. Despite the complex processes involved, Vesalius was not content with printing just the Fabrica. He also printed a second book, a brief but very large format compendium of descriptive anatomy he called epitome, or summary, of the seven books that comprise the Fabrica. The thin work, published in both Latin and German, included 11 anatomical plates and was oversized because, as Vesalius put it, the images could never be too large for the student. The reader was even provided two images to cut out and glue together to form a three-dimensional human figure. This approach to anatomical learning was revolutionary and elevated epitome to a unique pedagogical level. Renaissance students were actively engaged to participate in their own acquisition of knowledge. Now, more scarce than the Fabrica, only about 100 copies are known to exist, the epitome was clearly a heavily used reference work. As soon as Operinus completed the printing of the two texts in 1543, Vesalius packed a hand-colored copy of his monumental book into a saddlebag and rode by horseback to Germany where the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V was living while at war with France. Vesalius' intention was to prevent, present the Fabrica to the Emperor in hopes of securing his dream job, the post of imperial physician. He was appointed on the spot. The Fabrica has since been credited with fundamentally advancing Western medicine, culture, and art, and has been called the most famous book in medical science. We have copies of Vesalius's Fabrica for you to see in person here this evening. The Eccles Health Science Library owns a copy of the first edition published in 1543. This book was a gift presented in, in the late 1970s by plastic surgeon and University of Utah professor Dr. Clifford Snyder and his wife, Mary Odessa Morris in collaboration with Salt Lake City Dairyman and U of U alumnus George Winder and his wife, Lorna Bagley. The J. Willard Marriott owns a copy of the second edition, published in 1555, which was purchased by Special Collection in 1971. Both of these books were produced during Vesalius's lifetime and under his direct supervision. These are extremely rare books. An international survey of all existing copies published in 2018 indicated there are only 283 
extant copies worldwide of the 1543 first edition and only 386 surviving copies of the 1555 second edition. In addition to the first and second editions of the Fabrica, the libraries brought four other great books for you to look at after the presentation. These include a 1725 edition of Vesalius's Fabrica, produced 161 years after Vesalius's death, with all of the woodblock illustrations recut and printed as engravings. This exceptionally handsome book is currently on loan to the Eccles Library from Dr. John Opitz, a professor of pediatrics at the University of Utah School of Medicine and a foremost authority on medical genetics. Are you here with us this evening, Dr. Opitz? Well, you're in our thoughts. The Marriott Library also brought a copy of the Bremer Press limited edition Vesalius created in Germany in 1934. The book was printed from Vesalius's original woodblocks that were then 400 years old, and that, that idea will be addressed um, later in the program by Todd Sanderson. Samuelson, sorry, sorry. The current strategy for preserving these rare copies of Vesalius's text is to physically protect them from abrasion by housing them in snug-fitting rare book boxes. These provide physical protection, buffer the books from changes in temperature and relative humidity, and protect them from exposure to light and dust. Both libraries, the Eccle and Marriott, um, store their rear holdings in vaults that control temperature and relative humidity and light levels. Rare book boxes also protect books from inadvertent water events caused by roof leaks and broken pipes. Marriott Library's rare book vault was designed to strategically isolate the space from overhead culinary water pipes and to eliminate all sources of water inside the vault. Additionally, long-term uh, protections include reducing the risk of fire with building-wide smoke alarms and fire suppression systems. The Marriott Library's rare book vault is protected by a dry pipe pre-action fire suppression system because clearly, fire is a cruel enemy of cultural property. And finally, the Wasatch Fault is active, a situation that puts everything in the valley at risk. The Rare Book Fault at Eccles is currently in the process of adding seismic restraints similar to bungee cords to the shelving to prevent books from being thrown to the floor in the event of an earthquake. The stacks at Marriott Library are bolted to the concrete floors of the building, and the building itself was reinforced with inverted V braces during the retrofit 10 years ago. These braces will provide load paths that prevent building collapse by transferring horizontal seismic forces to the ground. To make this evening possible required the help and support of a number of kind and generous individuals, and I would like to thank them now. Um, first and foremost is Alberta Comer, Dean of the J. Willard Marriott Library and University Librarian, without whose support none of this would have been possible. I would also like to thank the curators, Louise Poulton from the Marriott Library and Heidi Greenberg from the Eccles Health Sciences Library, who graciously made it possible for you to see these books in person tonight. And I encourage you to stick around. It's really wonderful to look at them close up. Angela Wilkins is filming this evening's program for posterity. So if you're watching this as a film, please know you're welcome to visit the Eccles and Marriott Library to see these books in person. Jeff Davis designed the wonderful graphic images for the poster and everything else associated with this evening. Alfred Maudud maintains Marriott Library's Andreas Vesalius LibGuide webpage called Vesalius, 500 Years of Innovation. Heidi Brett and Jordan Hansen handled our public relations and social media. Nadia Durback and Eileen Hallett-Stone were my editors. And Michael Bigler coordinated all the local arrangements and knows where the skeletons are kept. <laughs> so our first speaker this evening is Michael Rudick, Professor Emeritus from the Department of English. Thank you. So, what I want to do in my brief talk is to suggest what we can learn by considering some material features 
of a book that was produced to achieve certain results for a reading public, to be sure, but also for the, for an, the author and the printer. Vesalius was a Flemish Catholic, while the printer, Johannes Oparinus, was a Swiss Protestant. Big, differ, big difference in post-Reformation Europe, but both men shared a culture. Both had enjoyed thoroughgoing humanist educations. Oporinus was, in fact, something of a polymath. He had studied medicine, and he taught Greek and Latin before taking up printing as a profession, which he learned from Johannes Froben, a publisher of very influential humanist authors in Basel. Oporinus picked up that tradition of issuing significant works of the time in all areas of learning in a format and quality that would advertise their claim to be modern classics. For Vesalius, of course, it was a matter of displaying hard-won knowledge about the human body, but also of professional status and patronage. That it's a big, hefty book is obvious. Folio format at this time was reserved for important works uh, like Bibles with commentaries or complete works of major authors, classical and modern. That the book we're dealing with is also a feast for the eyes is obvious as well. Format, typography, and illustration are executed with a lavishness that indicates the reading public that was addressed. The professional medical community certainly, but not limited to that, to that community. As well, there would be readers who shared the humanist culture of the author and the printer, connoisseurs of learning, uh, of visual art, of an elegant, if technical, Latin, or just those who appreciated deluxe books. Now, for such a book, the pictorial title page was a conventional, was conventional, and it would include the author's portrait. Now, here's an example from an earlier time, a fifth century manuscript of Virgil's poems, which I show to compare it to the Vesalius title page. To Virgil's left is his writing desk. To his right, a round carton for the storage of scrolls. Poet sits there magisterially on a monumental chair, almost a throne, holding a scroll in his hand. Now, this is less Virgil. The painter could not possibly have known what Virgil looked like. Then it is a picture of authorship with a capital A and the concomitant authority. But remark what the subject is not doing, that is writing. Writing is his business, but he's not uh, he's not doing it here, and that too is conventional. The figure of Vesalius on the title page of both editions and uh, <clears throat> that is the center of attention in a crowd scene, he and the body he works on, uh, and the close-up portrait in the second edition, this is from the second edition now on the screen, in contrast to the Virgil, show us the author at work. He is dissecting. Enacting his contention that professors of medicine ought to do their own dissection, not leave the cutting to barber surgeons while they delivered the commentary. Hands-on practice makes a departure that Vesalius wanted to foreground. The prejudice of a hierarchical society assumed that brain work was the job of an aristocracy, whereas uh, labor with the hands was reserved for the, for the lower orders. The dedication to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V above the picture on the title page tells readers that Vesalius had connections at the very top of the hierarchy, but tells us also that he earns the privilege of a professional aristocrat by using his hands to serve his brain. Further, it tells us how this professional aristocracy could claim status. In the educational curriculum of late antiquity and the Middle Ages, medicine was not included in the liberal arts. Again, aristocratic prejudice. Physicians were valued for technical know-how, but were men who had to earn a living. The liberal arts were for those who had leisure. The humanist curriculum in the 15th and 16th century changed that because ancient medical writings had quite as much status in this curriculum as poetry or philosophy or history, the other humanist subjects. Vesalius speaks of himself 
as the restorer of the glory attached to the ancient art of medicine. He places himself then not just as a physician, but as well in the elite company of humanists who transmitted the ancient learnings to the modern age, and he accords equal status to his printer. As a letter to Oporinus before the main text of the, of the Fabrica, and he addresses his printer as my very dear friend, my most dear friend, and honors him by his title, which he was entitled to. He was professor of Greek at Basel. Oporinus embraced a project altogether parallel to Vesalius's. He would produce a book that was worthy of its author and its subject. He would illustrate his own professional taste and worth and would place himself in the community of those who promoted humanist learning through the printing press. As Vesalius had a teaching career, he had, had went to school and had a, had a teaching career in Italy, Oporinus looked to Italy for his technical designs. His type fonts, let's have an example of that, his type fonts, fonts both Roman and Italic, are derived from those used in Venice by the pioneering humanist printer Aldus Minutius uh, for editions of Latin classics in the late 15th and early 16th century. The book also shows us his Greek font and even his Hebrew font. This slide shows the conclusion of the preface in Roman type and the uh, beginning of the letter to Oporinus in italic type, and just parenthetically, when you come up after we're done talking and look at the books, please observe the darkness of the impression on the page. Oporinus did not cut corners as so many printers did, and therefore his, the impression on the page is as dark now as it was uh, centuries ago, rather than looking rusty as so much 16th century printing now does because of, because of metallic content and, and, oxidation, and oxidation. Now, the artwork that illustrates, look at it here, the artwork that illustrates Vesalius's text is, <coughs> uh, owes, its, owes its style to antique models, to Greek, mainly to Greco-Roman uh, Greco sculpture. But the classical influence extends to more than the detail anatomical figures that illustrate the text. The woodcut, I want to focus now on the woodcuts. You'll see more of them, by the way. I'm just going to show one. The woodcuts that, uh, the block capital woodcuts that begin each of the seven books and the chapter divisions within them. They complement the text, but do so in a very interesting way. They show cute, chubby cherubs doing, of all things, practicing medicine. In other words, a parody on, a, 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 a parody on uh, what's in the text, but I don't think a parody in any, in, in any satiric sense, more humorous, I think, than satiric or deprecatory. The pictures range, as you say, you'll see more of them, the pictures range from the merely funny to the mildly obscene. The one I'm going to show now is one of the grotesqueries, the capital, the capital Q that op opens, one, opens one of the books. This looks to me like the vivisection of a wild boar chained to the table. The parodic element, though, goes yet further, because this, this is somewhat uh, ideological. Uh, the parodic element goes yet further in that we see something that Vesalius contended with, that is the assumption that animal dissection could teach human anatomy, which was the practice of Galen, the Greek physician of late antiquity, who was the authority on all subjects medical during the Middle Ages and in the early, in the early 16th century. There you see the students gathered around the table. And in the, in the left foreground down here is the professor reading from his textbook while another fellow does the cutting. <coughs> Now, Vesalius, despite his reservations, respected Gal uh, Galen enough to provide translations of some of his work, but evidently neither he nor Oporinus uh, objected to poking some gentle fun at, not at Galen, but at Galenists, uh, for the amusement of those who could get the joke. Now, next, this is a portrait of, of the printer, Johannes Op 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 Oporinus. Uh, he's about age 60. 
chose him as he would be remembered, venerable in his academic robe, pointing to his distinction as a professor, a classical philologist. And at the upper left, way up there, the upper left, his personal logo, or the, his printer's device, to use the technical term, pointing to his services to learning as a printer and publisher. Now here, finally, is another version of that device that appears on the final leaf in the 1555 edition of the, of the, the Fabrica. It depicts the Greek poet Arion, 7th century BC, who, legend has it, was saved from a mishap uh, at sea by a school of dolphins that had gathered because they were attracted to his lyre playing. In this picture, it's a fiddle, but Oporinus, we know, took it as an emblem of his life. His ability in the arts enabled him to overcome the crosses that fortune threw his way and to step over a sea of troubles to dry land. And the Latin motto, one of the mottos that he used, translates something like, standing still is no road to virtue. All in all, a remarkable collaboration. We may wonder what the two of them talked about. They must have had to speak Latin with one another. In 1543, when a beer or wine after the work day, when the book was going through its final stages of production. One thing they would later have in common, both died deeply in debt, such that generous friends had to pay for their funerals. The book indicates their taste for lavishness, no expense spared. Early biographical notices of Oporina say that he was too much the classical scholar and too much the dedicated printer to be a good businessman. Uh, I don't know about Vesalius. He had all sorts of positions and emoluments. Maybe he liked to live high. But in any case, the two of them left a monument to their professions, their respective professions, and also to themselves. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Todd Samuelson. I'm Assistant Director of Special Collections here at the Marriott Library. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with this company and group uh, talking about this remarkable book. Um, I'd also like to talk about a collaboration, uh, perhaps a little bit more practical, uh, but this is the collaboration and the production of the illustrations, specifically through the medium of relief printing or the cutting of wood blocks. Uh, the reason that this is a collaboration is that, in general, it's thought that uh, the majority of uh, the accomplishments of this process were the result of a collaboration between an artist and the block cutter or form schneider, a specialist who worked with knife and sometimes gouges to create the very elaborate work that you see before you. Um, and one of the things that I want to focus on is the way in which the, the blocks as physical material objects led to the illustrations in the books uh, were sometimes reused and repurposed, recycled, um, and, but, in, but in most cases did not last through their period um, and, and very, very few examples exist today. These are two blocks by uh, the German illustrator Albrecht Dürer. Uh, um, both of them in the, the holdings of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Both of them are uh, rather large blocks for this period, uh, 15 and a half or so by 11 inches, um, made of pear wood. Um, almost all of the blocks that were used were uh, pear or other fruit woods. Apple is sometimes seen. Um, woods like oak were too hard to be pliable for the, the knives of the uh, Form Schneiders, these cutters who would um, painstakingly create the, the cross hatching um, to imitate the, the lines of uh, the, the pen. One of the things that um, should be recognized is that during this period, this was the ascendancy of, of the relief print or, or woodblock printing as a medium. Uh, from about 1400 to 1600, this was the primary mode of illustration in books. But about 1550, um, the, 
woodblock print was uh, in competition with intaglio processes, etching and engraving, which would soon outstrip uh, woodblock production. Um, and so in, in the 1540s, uh, this really uh, is the, the high point of the uh, aesthetic possibility of, of the block cutter. Um, a few other things that I'd like to mention, just in terms of practicality. So the, the knife that would be used to, to cut away the block would leave these very fine lines, which then would be printed as a relief process, the same process that uh, was used with typography, so that the block could be printed in the common press, the wooden press, side by side with the body of the, of the type of the text. Um, or, so they could be printed side by side, or one within another, as we'll see momentarily. Um, one thing to recognize about this period uh, comes from a maxim that uh, is frequently said by Terry Bellinger, who is a book historian who founded a rare book school in Columbia and the University of Virginia. The first maxim that he gives of historical illustration, which is specific to uh, woodblock printing in particular, is that labor is cheap, materials are expensive. Now, the opposite is true today, of course, that labor is expensive and materials uh, can be easily found. But uh, even if labor is cheap in this period, it should not necessarily suggest that it's, it's easy to secure. And, and one of the things that we see in these blocks by Durer and some of the other examples that, that remain extant is that this is the pinnacle of a craft that, that was hard to obtain, that very few reached. And uh, its, its demise was so complete that in the 19th century, when a, a book was attempted to, to produce a, a history of xylography or, or woodblock printing, uh, no craftsman could be found to do the work at a high enough level to be able to reproduce images actually using this technique. They had to use wood engraving instead. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, why these blocks uh, tend not to exist and a little bit about the history of the blocks that we'll be seeing reproduced in, in these books. Um, part of the collaboration is the, the practice of transferring the artist's work to the block. This is one way in which this is done. This is uh, an allegorical drawing um, by Peter Bruchel, um, the elder, that has been placed directly on the, on the block. And if you look at the top left, you can see that uh, the, the process of, of cutting away the lines has begun. So you can see the, the careful parallel lines. You can see the cross hatching, which is made by painstakingly cutting away the negative space in between the lines. You can also see these uh, repeated um, circular um, negative spaces marring the block. And those are the results of some type of beetle that has been gnawing away at, at this block. Um, and so even, even the remaining blocks that exist today um, are, are very frequently damaged um, through the process of poor storage, um, inattention, um, and, and washing and, and simply just being in the, in the, printer's, in the printer's house. Um, here's another example of a block that um, quite amazingly uh, remains um, to be found and, and circulated. It's, a, it's quite a common object uh, because over 100 of these blocks were discovered in the 20th century and circulated. This is an herbal by Mattioli. Uh, this is the Czech edition, and you can see um, the, the quality of the, of the block, which is actually quite large um, for the, the period. Frequently, these illustrative wood blocks would be much smaller, something along the lines of two by three inches. Um, but you can see, in, in comparison with the sophistication of the Vesalius blocks, something that's much more routine and, and expected uh, in, in this Mattioli block. Um, this is from the collections at the Folger Shakespeare Library. And one of the things that's uh, wonderful about this particular block is that 
you can see if you reverse it that this uh, ethos of um, recycling and reuse is, is uh, very visible. Someone has taken this block and, and reused it, uh, cut another figure into it, um, presumably printed that, and then um, put aside the block um, to be found and, and used in teaching later. And, and this may be the ultimate example of um, barbarous reuse. Uh, this block at the top is from the collections of Redbook School. And as you can see, it's a block that once was a large block that contained uh, playing cards. Um, these tar this is a tarot deck. Uh, and, and we know that at one point, it was much larger than just showing these three cards. Because if you look at the reverse, you see the marks of a hinge, which was used as the front of a cupboard. So at some point, this block was uh, repurposed uh, for, for decorative furniture, uh, and then some enterprising antiques dealer, presumably, took this, cut it down to have more pieces, and, and uh, now it's being used um, for teaching, but it does show the way in which uh, the, the blocks were um, cannibalized by, by time, essentially. Which leads us to this. Um, it's a remarkable story, but uh, the fact that we have these blocks at the pinnacle of the aesthetic and technical um, possibility that, that actually um, remained, uh, remained extant uh, through all of this, um, this flurry of, of reuse and recycling. So what you see on the bed of this iron hand press are the two title pages, one of the, uh, the 14, uh, excuse me, the 1543 on the right of the, of the bed of the press, and the 1555 edition. And uh, what, what occurred is that in the 18th century, there, there were a couple of uh, rediscoveries of these blocks and, and an effort to reuse them. Um, but then in 1932, uh, in Munich, uh, an effort was made to, to see whether the blocks were still available. And in fact, the, uh, the pressman, the main pressman of the Bremer Press, a very well-regarded German press, fine press at the time, discovered in the uh, Ludwig Maximilians Universität Library a, a box that contained 230 blocks. Uh, essentially, all the blocks, including the large blocks and the first title page that, uh, that went into creating the, the first edition. Uh, shortly after this time, a, a private collector in Leuven um, sort of announced that he had uh, obtained the 1555 title page. And so in 1934, they were brought together placed side by side and printed uh, in this atlas, the Bremen Press Atlas, which you'll be able to see um, in, in moments in, in potentially, uh, many people believe, uh, a higher quality print job using the technology of the early 20th century printing trade with this Washington hand press or, or whatever they've used. Um, and the, the tragedy of, of this turn of history is that um, very shortly after this remarkable final edition was created with the blocks, um, on the 16th of May, 1940, uh, the University of Leuven Library was uh, bombed by German artillery and, and destroyed. And uh, four years later to the day, on 16th of July, oh no, excuse me, I'm, I'm a few months off. Um, in July of 1944, the Munich Library, the LMU Munich Library, was also destroyed by B-17 bombers. And so the blocks which had almost miraculously escaped desecration and reuse over time um, met their end in the 20th century. But they do represent uh, the, the pinnacle of um, artistic vision, scientific ingenuity, and technical craft in the, in the collaboration between the, the various creators of the book. Thank you.
evening. All right, hold on. I have to situate and try not to fall down. Okay, I'm going to give you a little history uh, before Vesalius. I'm going to sneak up on Vesalius tonight. So. The development of anatomy as a scientific subject occurred because dissections, porcine, then human, we saw, right, the boar, became possible within the context of the university medical school. In the early 14th century, several physicians in Paris began to demonstrate dissection and use anatomical illustrations in their instruction, including Mondino, Henri de Mondeville, Guido de Vigavano. Their anatomical drawings were based on empiricism, but because of the limits of dissection, including the necessary speed with which they took place, they were often stylized iconographies. The first official dissection of a woman in the West took place around 1315, and Mondino mentions that special attention was paid to the anatomy of the uterus. His teacher, Taddeo Aldorati, expressed disappointment that he had not had the opportunity to observe the pregnant female anatomy, indicating the rarity of the available female corpses, and especially gravid ones. Anatomical maps and schematics, charts of the bodily systems, and organs intended to help medical students remember what they saw so quickly, included the medieval Funf Builder series, or Five Picture Series, a group of stylized anatomic schematics used for instruction that consisted of semi-squatting figures to illustrate bones, nerves, muscles, veins, and arteries. With analogs in Persian anatomy, they were all male figures in the customary frog pose, as it's called, except for the gravida, or pregnant disease woman, that is sometimes include in, included in the series and occasionally stood alone. And I think it's worth mentioning that they saw pregnancy as a disease. Right? The Aristotelian schema held that men acted as the standard, and the fact that women are thus inverted or imperfect males meant that anatomists used male bodies as a template, which was then altered to describe the female and pregnant anatomies. In this way, they created official visual discourse on the parturient woman, which was at best imperfect and at worst nearly wholly inaccurate. In Pseudo-Galen's Anatomia, the gravid figure is one of eight, which includes also skeleton man, muscle man, wound man. In this case, her occupied uterus is located in the approximate, let's see, there it is, correct location, and labeled with matrice apera, uterine opening. Um, but it is drawn simplistically as an oval container. We call those container uh, uteruses. Uh, her body also becomes the text itself as it contains written information and instructions to the student. To the medieval mind, trained to react to the conceptual as much as to the visual, it was sufficient to imagine the mysterious pregnant female the emergence of anatomical illustrations based on empirical observation during the Renaissance led to a paradigm shift of bodily spatial awareness. The first anatomic illustration of a gravid woman drawn from a dissection dates to the woodcuts of Johannes de Catham's Vesiculo de Medicine of 1494. In the gravida figure, for example, her uterus is located on her left side. I can't, can't even, there, there it is. Um, uh, uh, it's located on her left side, although it is shaped more appropriately. Um, so it's not just an oval anymore. These 15th century illustrations are post-dissection era, but contain no more accurate information for the viewer than those that came before, and in some cases, arguably less. Here, disembodied uteruses line the top of the page. Um, uh, uh, they, they, they line the top of the page and they each contain, I don't know if you can see, there's, they're actually cut off, the little heads on the left side, but they each contain a fetus 
uh, in different presentations. These are fetal presentations, of course. Um, these fragmented organs provided information for midwives to prepare, prepare to aid in delivery. Before Andreas Vesalius's Fabrica was published in 1543, the precision of anatomical images was rudimentary and spatial, and the focus on the utility of gaining accurate information that was so vital for the Renaissance scholars was minimal. However, from a representation, representational space perspective, these images were useful for their proximity and relation to other organs and internal structures, especially in the pregnant female figure. The viewer gained symbolic understanding that one could enter the body and see the viscera. By the 15th century, the illustrations had become more realistic, standing erect, not in the frog, frog pose any longer, indicating empiricism and dissection observation. But ironically, the more detailed and realistic, the more fragmented and objectified these images became with a focus on organ studies instead of on systemic, on systems. The tradition of public anatomies began in earnest by the late 16th century, but while anatomical illustrators knew that their depictions of the female body were distorted, fragmented, and fantastic, they continued to perpetuate this bodily dissonance. Jacopo Berengario's Anatomia from 1535, only eight years before the Fabrica, contains an image of a woman, abdomen open to the viewer's gaze like in a dissection, pointing to her disembodied uterus in a fragmentation of the body. Vesalius's work changed the visual traditions of anatomical illustration, challenging Galenic, Aristotelian, Arabic, and astrological schemas in favor of intricate and anatomical views based on human dissection rather than on the medieval imagined anatomy. But even Vesalius's hyper-detailed anatomical figures were often depicted as alive, standing in the countryside, as we saw, or posed in contemplation. However, his illustrations were hyper-detailed, reflecting the Renaissance focus on the utility of information and empiricism. Vesalius, therefore, ushered in a paradigm shift, and from the mid-16th century onward, anatomy was no longer proximal proximal in a relative imagined landscape, but instead in a highly detailed view that sometimes still fragmented by severing limbs, for example, but forever changed the way we study the human body. Thank you. I'm Nadia Derbach from the History Department, and I am going to shift our view slightly to the subject on the slab. So we remember Vesalius for the masterful practices that made the body's interior visible to us and thus knowable. But to do this required many bodies for dissection. Though dissection was not illegal in Vesalius' day, the use of the human body for this purpose existed in a gray area. In popular culture, the idea that the body should be properly interred as a whole person was key to the vision of its resurrection and thus the soul's ultimate salvation. Thus, in Vesalius' day, no one willingly donated their bodies to science. Vesalius used criminals, and sometimes he stole the executed bodies for this purpose. Now this was tacitly sanctioned because it was widely agreed that those who had violated the earthly laws did not deserve the spiritual rewards of the afterlife. There is thus a long history of people actually being sentenced for crimes to death and dissection. In England, Henry VIII set aside the bodies of six executed criminals each year for the use of anatomists. But even those whose sentence did not include dissection often wound up on the slab. Until well into the 19th century, anatomists made deals with executioners to obtain the bodies for a fee or merely stole them from the gallows. At the same time as Vesalius was dissecting criminals, others were obtaining the bodies through grave robbing. Since the dead body was in effect no one's property, this was not necessarily illegal, but it was widely condemned as immoral. By the 18th century, though, this had become commonplace. Often called resurrectionists, 
Grave robbers dug up the recently interred corpses from burial grounds under the cover of night, sometimes even with the help of the graveyard's night watchmen. Now this practice disproportionately affected the poor. The poor were often buried in cheap mass graves, sometimes without a coffin, making them very easy to dig up. The rich, on the other hand, could equip their graves with anti-theft devices. <laughs> Jews, too, were prime targets as their burial practices involved quick interment rather than the extended practices of watching and waking that were practiced by many Christian denominations. This meant that Jewish bodies were fresher and thus prized for dissection. In the United States, African Americans similarly became prime targets of body snatching. The ability to see if race was or was not merely skin deep only increased the desirability of non-white bodies. By the late 18th century, the French had solved the problem of supply by using those who died in their public hospitals. These were free charity hospitals that catered to those with no other means of access to treatment. Patients who died on their wards became property of the hospital, a site of medical training. Those who sanctioned their dissection maintained they were upholding the principle that those who had benefited from free care should pay back society. That they had died while receiving this free medical care seems not to have registered with the revolutionaries who devised this system. And those on Medicare and Medicaid should kind of think about this, right? <laughs> Now, Britain introduced a similar system after an enterprising couple named William Burke and William Hare bypassed the problems associated with body snatching and went straight to murder instead. They were caught in 1828, but only after committing a series of homicides undertaken solely for the purpose of selling the bodies to the anatomy schools. Now, obviously, the anatomists could read the signs of foul play on the bodies, but they paid no attention to this, and they paid up nonetheless, desperate to satisfy their paying students' demands to have that hands-on experience that Vesalius was advocating. Now, in Britain, it was not poor patients, but just the destitute in general who were to wind up on the slab. All those who'd become dependent on state welfare for their upkeep were required to enter a workhouse from the 1830s onwards. Should they die while under the state's so-called care, their bodies would immediately be conveyed to anatomy schools for dissection. And uh, I'm not good with pointers. You can see that going on down here. The United States soon followed suit. Various states passed similar laws that ensured that the bodies of those who died in a range of public institutions would become available for anatomical study. And this included a disproportionate number of African Americans. The history of dissection, and thus modern medicine, is thus intimately bound up in the commodification of the body. Corpses could be bought, sold, traded, and stolen. The bodies that entered the commercial marketplace were largely members of marginalized communities with little economic, political, or social power. The poor, criminals, racial and ethnic minorities. The 100% donation rate today, which yields bodies from a range of social groups, should not obscure this longer history. We must remember, acknowledge, and thank the many nameless subjects of dissection who are intimate partners in the making of modern medicine. We are all indebted to the subjects on the slab, and it is precisely because most did not choose to participate in this enterprise that we should remember our history and consider what we owe. Thank you. I'm Gretchen Case, and I'm down here from the medical school. I teach arts and humanities at the medical school, which means I do things differently than a lot of people do, and I'm often seen carrying strange things around. And um, one of the classes I teach is called Art and Medicine, Medicine and Art. And so I'm going to be talking about this piece back here, for which I was one day last week carrying around huge reams of paper and glue guns and things like that. And I teach it to fourth years, but I ran into a first year, and she said, Dr. Case, what is it today? What are you doing? And so I started explaining that I had the fourth years in art and medicine, and we were, we were building this body based on Vesalian figures, and I went on and on and on. And she looked at me and she said, 
is that like a mythical person? Or, you know, what are you talking about? And this is not anything that, that um, is against that student, because for one thing, I get very excited when I talk, so it sounded like maybe I was just telling a story, uh, this mythical Vesalius. But also, this is not, these books are not where our students learn anatomy now. They learn from different books, so this name is not with them. So when I started working with my fourth year students who are at the very end of their education, so most of them take my course as the final course that they take before graduating, um, I started by saying, well, let's go look at the, at the books, which we had at Eccles. And one of the most exciting moments was pointing to the door of the history of medicine room at the Eccles Health Sciences Library that they'd never noticed. And I said, come this way, enter this room. And we came in to see these books. And as someone who is trained as a historian and had spent a lot of time in archives, I was already thrilled to be in there and I wanted them to share that thrill with me. And the first question was, what are they worth? How much are they worth? Which I thought was very interesting, but actually revealed how value, they, they understood the value of what was in front of them. And then they were thrilled at the chance that they got to touch them and to turn the pages. And we looked at these books in the context of some other books, like one of the herbals that we saw earlier, um, an amputation kit from the Civil War, a medics kit from World War II, some caricatures from the 18th centuries. So they got introduced to kind of this history of medicine and the body and the way that anatomy works. And then we went back to work on our own piece. And what they decided to do was to build a Vesalian figure. And when you get to come up here later and look at it, they want you to know a few things about this. And one of them is that they went to humor very quickly, and that was on purpose. So up here you'll see lots of things that are funny, that are kind of gallows humor, that seem like inside jokes, and they are. And this is out of, um, uh, this is for many reasons, and one of the reasons that they cited first is, first of all, they saw those little cherubs in the illuminations that we heard about earlier, and they thought, oh, there's humor in this, right? And they're very familiar with the, the kind of gallows humor that you use to make sense of the weird things that happen in medicine and medical school. Um, also because part of what they decided they wanted to do was talk about not only the knowledge that they have, but the ways in which they are now expected to take all of this that's stuffed into their brain and translate it to a lay audience. And how often that means pee instead of <laughs> the bladder or some very anatomical term. So I hope you get a chance to look at this. But they want you to know that the humor is intentional and they understand what they are doing with it. They also want you to see that the background, we mimic the landscapes of the Vesalian figures. The background, I asked them to bring in things from medical school that meant something to them and that they were ready to sacrifice. And much of what we used were real, real notes from first year. So, so many of the students had kept their notes from first year anatomy lab or they had their flashcards and we built a landscape out of that and painted it. Um, some of the organs are built from their histology books, so you'll see actual, like the liver has liver cells on it. And what they wanted you to know about that is that as silly as they are being here, kind of humorous, their background is very serious and they have a ton of information tucked into their heads. They also wanted to say, and look at us stepping out of this. So this rite of passage where we have to get all this information into us, we have to learn how to work with bodies and we are coming out of it. Right? Oh, I forgot to change my slides so you could see them working on it. So one of the students actually laid down to, to draw the piece and then they all worked on it together. I asked them to talk about um, why, like their artistic process. And they didn't really want to talk about that because they don't think of themselves as artists, they think of themselves as physicians. And what they wanted to talk about instead was this moment in which they were making this. This moment in which they are done with their coursework for the most part, they know they're going to be physicians, but they haven't graduated yet. So they're, in, they're, they're in this holding moment. And this is part of why I teach this class at this moment, because they know they're okay and they can try new things. But they wanted to talk about that they're in a state of mind where they feel like they can express themselves. They know how important and how powerful humor is and what it does. Um, they liked the moment of working with classmates that they might never see again because they're spreading out all over the country and out all over the world. One of them said he really liked using the scissors. Um, <laughs> They also said they're scared, scared that they've forgotten everything, that they're walking out of this landscape and they're leaving it behind and they won't remember it, that they're moving, 
both physically, many of them are moving to a new place, and they're moving forward in their lives. Um, and also, they are losing, by leaving all this behind, they're losing the safety and security of being a medical student, and now they have to become a doctor. So I want to point you to one final thing on this piece that I hope you'll come and look at later, and that is that the face is covered. This is something from their first year anatomy lab that they are allowed to, if they choose, when they work on teams dissecting a cadaver, cover the face. Many of them choose to do that because of the, really the kind of brutality of what they have to do to the body. If they cover the face, it makes it somehow easier to face what they are doing. So the very last piece we put on this, they said we should cover the face. And that's actually the hem of a white coat. So it's a student's white coat that has been cut out and covered the face. And this, in this act of shrouding, I see what happens when old anatomical art meets new physicians, and I think it's reason for great hope, which is as much as medical school has thrown at these students, as often as they've witnessed what's kind of a dehumanization, and as tired and as cynical as they might sometimes appear, and as much as they recognize the absurdity of the human condition and use humor to cope and try to bond with their patients and with each other, here they are, full circle, four years later, right back at the moment of reverence that is one body touching another body. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Louise Poulton. I'm the managing curator and head of the rare books department at the Marriott Library. And this is my colleague, uh, Luba Basin, who is the um, curator of rare books. Uh, Gretchen, I loved your description of your students walking in kind of nonplussed at uh, the idea of learning with books, um, and especially old books, that they could touch them. Um, there's nothing like introducing history to students using books. Um, the rare books department has about 80,000 pieces in its collection, everything ranging from Sumerian clay tablets to 21st century artist books. I'd like to say everything in between, but I can't, but we're working on it. I see Greg back there. That's what Greg does. Thank you, Greg. Um, what do we do with all these books? Uh, well, what we do is we use them to introduce students to history and to demonstrate, we hope, the depth and the breadth of what history can teach us about ourselves and about our world now. Here are some numbers. Between fall 2013 and spring 2019, we gave 515 presentations to more than 9,400 participants using nearly 13,000 pieces from the collection. We introduced Vesalius 49 times to students taking courses in English, art, art history, honors, writing, and Latin. We presented our second edition of, to, of Vesalius uh, at a College of Science lecture. We presented to community members taking classes from Usher Lifelong Learning and to classes from Realms of Inquiry, to the people who work in campus facilities, and to employees of a local graphic design company, to Ute student groups and international student groups. We are convinced that there is nothing like holding the real thing in your hands, as was. Vesalius, still true. And now, so are all of those students. They, their stunned silence gives way to, um, to something pretty f profound, something that they rarely forget, actually. We hear it back from them much later. Um, we presented our Vesalius, the Eccles First Edition, and many other historical editions in an exhibition in 2014, held in honor of the 500th anniversary of the publication of Vesalius's Great Anatomy 
and Mark Nielsen gave a wonderful lecture on Vesalius to a packed house. Once the physical exhibition came down, we put it into digital form. Each, okay. uh, each book with a little information and high resolution images tells part of a larger story, a story that is history, but well suited to the present and worth telling in the future. Eight years ago, we began a humble but dedicated blog highlighting pieces from the collection with a short description and strong images and events like this of interest. If you were to search Vesalius in the blog, you would find quite a few posts about our 2014 Vesalius event. But you would also find two posts about how two students use their introduction to Vesalius for their work and their scholarly pursuits. In this post, we thanked a former student for sending her prints. We are thanked by a former student for sending her prints of images from our Vesalius while she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana. We loved her response, Vesalius, Vesalius. And here is a post about a reading for an English course featuring a short story written by then undergraduate Luba Basin. Luba's inspiration was Vesalius. Holding rare books is not just show and tell. Holding rare books includes lectures, conversations, discussions, assignments, quizzes, papers, and sometimes blog posts. These students, taught by Isabel Dufano, were assigned to write blog posts for one of her Spanish courses. The students are now a part of the online discussion, and in this case, the post is in Spanish and has nothing to do with anatomy. It has, however, everything to do with people. In this case, the wretched treatment of indigenous populations in Mesoamerica, the New World. This book was published in 1552, between the publication of the first edition of Vesalius's work on anatomy and the second edition, both works, one monumental, the other small and humble, made a difference in the lives of people then and now. So I'll say it one more time. You've heard it over and over today, tonight. Uh, as one great song proclaims, there ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. <laughs> that is how history is made. That is how history educates. Books are not dead. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is David Morton and I uh, direct the anatomy program for the School of Medicine. And so dissection is one of the most universally recognizable steps in becoming a doctor. Now it wasn't always this way. We take a look at Galen that's been mentioned before. So back in Galen's day, and you can see where he, uh, the time frame he lived, which is a little while, the writings he had in his lifespan was about 10 million words, and then there was fires, there's always fires, and then a bunch of his stuff was lost, so now there's a remaining about 3 million words of things that he wrote. So he wrote a lot, he was a big advocate of observation and experimentation, he did a lot of cool things. He'd take lungs out of pigs and he'd pump them up and he demonstrated, hey, if you push air through here, this thing vibrates and it makes a sound, and he started talking about the way the larynx works. But even though he was a big advocate of observation and experimentation, it's interesting that that didn't relate to anatomy in some ways. He then said, hey, hey, there's a lot that goes on in medicine, so well, I'm gonna take care of anatomy. So I'm gonna write a bunch, millions of words worth, don't worry about anatomy, guys, do something else, it's done. So, in, when looking at some of the pictures that represent Galen, take a look at this one at the bottom. There's Galen, and there's a pig. And then later on, other art, they're like, hey, there's Galen, and he's dissecting a monkey. So some interesting things to note is that Galen said, I'm going to write about anatomy, but what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to dissect a pig, 
<laughs> then I'm going to put a lot of words down, millions of them, based upon what I saw in a pig, and then I'm going to do a bunch of other pictures and abstract that and say, hey, I think this is what it looks like in a human, and then I'm going to give these to med students and say, all right, guys, have fun, that's the human body, now treat patients. An interesting thing is that Galen never dissected a human cadaver, and his anatomy theories remained unchanged for 1,300 years. Because he said, hey, I've already written about anatomy, don't worry about it. So no one did. Now that's, I shouldn't say that, that's actually not quite accurate, but that theory, the impression of Galen lasted for 1,300 years. Now Galen, meet Vesalius. So when Vesalius came around, he was different. Vesalius then said, every time I'm shown, I want this to be. This is actually from the template from the front page of his book. There's Vesalius and there's a cadaver. This is something that's interesting whenever we see Vesalius. So Vesalius, he said, you know what I'm going to do? If we're going to teach the human body, this is a crazy idea. Let's dissect a human body. And then, when we dissect the human body and what I see with my eyes and what I feel with my hands, then I'm going to write that in the book. And the pictures are going to mirror what we dissected. And so all the pictures that came with what Vesalius did matched what he saw. And that's what he was going to give to med students. With the idea that, hey, if we're treating humans maybe we should actually be dissecting humans to teach what the humans look like when we're treating the Cubans, is what he said. And so in his book, something that's interesting is he wanted to make sure that this philosophy was brought out. He then included a template of the picture, a picture of the dissection instruments he used, and also instructions on the different dissections. It was interesting that Michael showed earlier some of those uh, really cool little letters and the uh, cherubs and that they're inside. In there, he's got these cool processes that if you look about how he like took the skin off the bones. I saw the skeleton up here and reminded me that the longest that the oldest skeleton that has been dissected and used for teaching is from Vesalius. The, the oldest one that we have today, and the way he did it is he put these old cherubs, they put it in a box with holes, and he put it to the bottom of a river, and then they anchor it there and let the water rush through it and let the water take care of all the little tissue parts and leave it there for, I don't know, a really long time, and then dig it back up. He's got a cool little picture in a letter. I digress. All right, so now... Back to then for, for this idea of Galen is that in Galen, when, and from his time forward, for hundreds and hundreds of years, there was always three people teaching anatomy. At the top, the lector. This was the individual who had the book that would talk, that was a book written about animal dissections for the most part. Then you had other two people that were down by the body. You had the person saying, oh, we're dissecting the heart? Hey, dissect the heart. And they say, dissect the heart. And then the sector, that barber surgeon, would then dissect the heart. The person up here is far away because of the smell of the cadaver and also up high because they're better than what's going on down there. They can't be, be part of that. Vesalius hated this. He said, quote, the hateful method by which one dissects the body and another describes its parts. The first perched on a pulpit like a crow, haughtily repeating ideas that he didn't learn directly from the cadaver, but that he read that he read in others' books. He didn't like that. Now let's go back to this picture, and we get close. Vesalius is personifying all three figures in him. He's the one talking. He's the one pointing. And there's the dissection instruments. He's the one doing the dissection. So when you then have this face-off between Vesalius and Galen, if you're going to say, well, this is career suicide in some ways, that I'm going to say this person that I revere, that I respect, but I actually disagree with, and you see this between especially the first and second editions, if you're going to do this and say, I'm going to go up to the face of 1,300 years, you've got to have to have evidence. And that's one of the reasons that Vesalius changed medicine. Because up to that point, hey, what's the human body? I don't know, what did Galen say? Yeah, that's what it is. And he said, uh-uh, that's why all these pictures look. This is the, you've seen this picture that each of us have shown in these presentations. 
He's beside a cadaver. If I'm going to go against what Galen said, I want to prove it. And this was the beginning of what we now in modern day call evidence-based medicine. If you're going to do something that will then influence a patient, what are you basing that upon? And this he used for things that you can see, but that process, the scientific method, this evidence-based medicine is knitted within the rest of history. So we take a look in Padua University. There is Galen with the cadaver. Here is St. George's Hospital in London in the mid-1800s. And in the very forefront is Henry Gray that a lot of people know, not so much of Gray's Anatomy, like the TV show, but Gray's Anatomy is in the textbook. And there's Henry Gray, and there's a cadaver surrounding with students and professors. University of Utah, 1905, look what's in the middle of the students and the professors, a cadaver. University of Utah, 1955, the cadaver is at the center with students, and there's Dr. Hashimoto who taught anatomy here for many, many years. Here we then take a look at 1973. There's these med students, and I want them to focus on something is look at them. Do they look like they're bored? Do they look like they're asleep? Are they checking Twitter? They are engaged in what they're doing. We take a look at 2007. Dr. Sock Hatch from Pathology, a physician who's working with our students in the lab. Who's at the center? We now take a look at 2015, and there again we see at the center is the cadaver. That, that element that Vesalius introduced has not changed. I gotta tell you, something cool happened tonight that for some reason never struck me until I was sitting here, and that is this book right here. I'm not touching it. This book right here is the first edition, and I can't remember if it was Randy or Michael who said that this edition was created and Vesalius was still around, that there was this element of history meeting today that I had this, in, this surge of pride might not be the right word, of honor, like a sacred feeling that that book touched by Vesalius who changed medicine is what I'm trying to carry on in 2019 with our medical students. One big difference is our donors willingly donate and that there is a great amount of effort brought in to ensure that respect is given to our donors and every one of them that comes through our lab who they all are within a 50 mile radius of Salt Lake City who donate to our body donor program. Now we take a look at 2019. We study the human body in many different ways. Here is showing a radiologist looking at uh, CT scans in axle and coronal and sagittal sections. We use ultrasound, which now you can get an ultrasound probe for under $2,000 and not only see tissue, but see tissue that's functioning. We now have these really cool tables, like an anatomosh table that we have at the Eccles Science Library. You can load it with these images and radiographs, and then with my finger, go like this, and one layer, and another layer, and another layer, and another layer, and go shing, and you can cut the cadaver within seconds. We can now see anatomy in ways that Vesalius never imagined. But there's a cautionary tale with this as we continually have this influx of information. Med school is still four years. Four years, two years preclinical, two years clinical. The, and we're not really getting less knowledge nowadays. We're getting a little bit more knowledge nowadays. But med school still doesn't change. So we have this reduction in curriculum, fewer hours for all disciplines, anatomy included where we used to have 380 hours to dissect a cadaver a few decades ago, we are now down to 60 to 70 hours of dissection at the University of Utah. And what happens is, because of making way for all these other disciplines, the patient's structure and function that we use in anatomy, time can be lost. In a paper that was published by a graduate student here at the University of Utah, Dr. Cottom, in a paper where he surveyed residencies across the United States about the preparedness of their residents, he made the following, the data came in and he made the following statement. Overall, 57% of residency program directors felt that residences, residents needed a refresher course in gross anatomy upon arrival. 29% felt that they were adequately prepared and 14% felt they were seriously lacking. So a third of our residents are okay with their anatomy by the time they hit their residencies, which is when they're treating patients. Two-thirds of them need refresher courses. We cannot forget that it is important 
that our future physicians know the human body. As Vesalius said, when the hand is used, medicine flourishes. When it is neglected, medicine languishes. When it is restored to use, medicine can flourish again. Meaning, when we feel we're above getting our hands dirty and getting our learning. And when we do that, we lack a certain knowledge and understanding. But by getting our hands, to lack of a better word, dirty, and learning this human body, medicine can flourish. On a final note, Mark Nielsen, my colleague here in biology who also teaches anatomy, he and I a couple of years ago had a chance to go to Zakynthos in Greece where Vesalius passed away. On the way back from a pilgr he went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. On the way back, the, the thought is he and some other members had scurvy. They stopped in this island. He walked out and died on the beach. And so that's where they held this anniversary of Vesalius. And Mark and I had a chance to go, and they have this statue up there recognizing Vesalius. And i got to say, I'm thrilled to have a chance to speak here and to stand alongside these books and that each of you have an opportunity to come up and see anatomy, medicine, and history. Thank you. So I have the distinct privilege of following these wonderful, these wonderful esteemed colleagues of mine and, and trying to maybe wrap this all up. And in 1977, 42 years ago, I was first introduced to Andreas Vesalius. I think it was within a year I came up and saw this wonderful book. And it, it just turned me on. <laughs> I was in an anatomy class, I got so excited, and I wanted to know all about this individual. And over the past 42 years, I think I've read everything I could about Andreas Vesalius. I've had wonderful opportunities, as Dave mentioned, to meet with some of the most brilliant scholars and historians and art historians who have studied him and were at this conference. And so what I'd like to do is just take some of everything that's said and, and summarize some things. And I'm getting kind of old, and I had cataract surgery, which helped me for long distance, but didn't do a lot for my short distance. So now I, I need to kind of have my little readers. So let's begin. Frederick Nietzsche, in his classic tale, thus spake Zarathustra, tells of a wise man who after many years of isolation comes down from a mountain to liberate the townspeople of their misconceived lives. As one who knows the truth, the man runs amongst the people, explaining that they can be free if they will look, pay attention, look to see the lies that are oppressing them. Unwilling to hear the wise man's enlightened words, the townspeople mock him, throw stones at his head, and call him a madman. Unable to move his audience, the wise man, disillusioned and frustrated, returns to his homes, home in the mountain, asking, must one first smash their ears so they learn to hear with their eyes? Enter Andreas van Wessels of Brussels, a.k.a. as many at that time in the professional and humanities changes his name to the Latin, Andreas Vesalius Brusselensis, the hero of our symposium. Okay? Now, as you've heard from multiple speakers, there's an important historical setting here. And that important historical setting goes back. And it involves many characters, Hippocrates, Aristotle, and Galen, all important people in the history of anatomy. What we would call the codifiers of anatomy. Now, as Dave shared with you, Galen, Claudius Galen of Pergamon, 
played a really important role. And what I would like to do in my studies, I've gone to as much as I could of the original literature and tried to, to share with you some quotes from some of these individuals. And Galen, as Dave mentioned, was often called the Prince of Physicians. He was an amazing writer and student of anatomy and medicine. And he, as you've learned, did a lot. But he didn't always work on humans. He never did. But he, in his own words, said, I have done as much for medicine as Trajan did for the Roman Empire when he built bridges and roads through Italy. It is I, and I alone, who have revealed the true path of medicine. It must be admitted that Hippocrates already staked out this path. He prepared the way, but I have made it passable. Okay. He was confident. <laughs> he believed his conclusions were infallible. Yet, he was an adamant proponent, as was mentioned, that physicians learn and discover truths through firsthand observations and hands-on research rather than by trusting the untested claims of authorities. Now, after Galen, the West goes into darkness, <laughs> so-called dark ages, right? And I don't claim to be a, a big historian, and uh, you know, there's all kinds of debates that was it really all that dark? But anyway, um, we don't, things moved off into the, to the Arabic world. The Greek writings were translated into Hebrew and Arabic and maintained. And then as the Renaissance, re as the Western world reemerges and the studies reemerge, Greek texts start to reemerge. And there's translations of the stuff out of the Arabic world. And as the Greek texts were unearthed, corrupt, corrupt Latin translations were purified. A sense of getting closer to the pure, real springs of inspiration, to the pristine origins of all the wisdom that God had initially imparted to man. That was the essence of the Greek masters. Okay? Well, that's where Vesalius enters the story. He enters this story into this period, and the problem, as was clearly stated, was the Renaissance masters were teaching Galenic thought. And there wasn't a lot of big dissection going on. They were relying on the works of Galen. Okay. We started to see some dissection, especially in northern Italy, but Vesalius attended medical school in Paris. And during his medical school, so you've got to realize his father was an illegitimate. That's why he couldn't go to medical school. So he became apothecary to the Holy Roman Emperor. But during that time, he was such a great guy that the Holy Roman Emperor makes him legitimate, which made Vesalius legitimate, he could then attend medical school. He goes to medical school, and in Paris, his teachers were some of the major translators of Galen. The University of Paris had bought the complete editions of Galen's works that had been translated. He became a Galen scholar, but he loved to dissect. And his goal in dissection was to prove Galen right. But what did he find? It wasn't. <laughs> there were problems. Galen had never dissected a human. And that was a problem, right? So that's where Galen, or Vesalius, comes onto the scene. You know, a great student of Galen, a Galen scholar. And he then starts really dissecting. And as Dave clearly pointed out, at that time, 
there was the scholar up on the podium, up on the mountain. And the people down below didn't know what was going on. And so let me just write, read you some quotes. Vesalius says, The vile ritual in the universities by which some perform dissections of the human body while others recite anatomical information, the latter in their egregious conceit squawk like jackdaws from their lofty professional chairs, things that they never have done only memorized from the books of others. As everything is being wrongly taught and the day passes in silly questions, students are learning no more than they could if they were being taught by a butcher in a meat market. And he talks about his professor. I wish there may be inflicted on my body, one for one, as many strokes as I have ever seen him attempt to make on the bodies of man or beast, except at the dinner table. They weren't dissecting. Okay. Now, Vesalius, and I had an opportunity to really, there's the University of Bologna, the only oldest university in the Western, Western world. And you still see the arena from back just after Vesalius' time. Now, Vesalius came down from the podium, as we've learned. And he came down from the podium, and as Dave clearly showed you, you know, did the dissection. And this is important because like the Nietzsche's tale of the wise man coming down from the mountain who knew the truth, so did Vesalius. He came down from the podium because he had been dissecting and he knew the truth. And he wanted to share that with his students. Now, he was reviled. His teachers, the Galenic scholars, this is Silvius, Jacob Silvius, who was one of his teachers. Emperor, the emperor should punish him severely for his example of ignorance, ingratitude, arrogance, and impiety, to suppress him so that he may not poison the rest of Europe with his pestilent breath. But Vesalius hung in there, and he shares this thought. He said, these men could not believe that Galen, the father of medicine, had made such mistakes in the anatomical books they felt he had written with so much care and accuracy. Gradually, however, they began to change their attitude, and there was not one among them with the cadaver before him who could continue to defend Galen. However reluctantly, they came to put more faith in their own eyes than in the words of Galen. Now, this all culminates in his masterpiece, The Fabrica. Okay? And I got to sit on a bus ride in Zacynthos with Martin Kep a Latin and Greek scholar and a major scholar of Da Vinci and also of this period. And he writes this, every aspect of each page, talking about the fabrica, every aspect of each page declares his rigorous control of the whole and the parts. The result is one of the greatest of all master, masterpieces of visual and verbal communication designed to convince us with skilled rhetoric that we can indeed trust our eyes and ears. Stephen Joffe says, there are moments in the history of humanity when an event occurs that is so extraordinary and unexpected that the world, for better or worse, has changed forever. The appearance of Vesalius' Fabrica in 1543 marks one of these times. So, Vesalius made a big difference, as we've learned today. In the practice of medicine, the Renaissance saw the classical medical scholars of antiquity defied, deified, and staunchly deemed infallible and irreproachable. 
Like the enchanting songs of the sirens, their authoritative voices were so deafening that even one's eyes could be fooled into believing that they could see what was not truly there. For the wise man Vesalius, who climbed down from the podium and was able to silence the noise of the past, a new reality appeared. Through the insistent performance of dissection, Vesalius created a silent refuge for himself in the raw physical anatomy of the human body, an act that quite, that quite literally gave him sight. This is the story of the wise man that did not return to the podium, but instead through the development of an astounding book, created a silence in the field of medicine that would allow others also to see. He smashed their ears so that they could hear with their eyes. And in a final tribute to this wonderful, wonderful skull, if you look on one of his skeleton, beautiful skeletal plates, you'll see carved into the plate, Vivitar Inguino. Genio. I'm trying to do good Latin with a Latin scholar in front of me. <laughs> Quitera mortis errant. I love this. Genius lives on. All else is mortal. Andrews to say this. Thank you. We have time for a few questions if you'd like to. Um, probe something from the speakers. Do we have any, any interest in that or would you like to see the books? What would you like? See the books? Let's see the books. Come up here. Yes. I'd just like to say a few words about looking at the books. Please, please. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Oh. oh, I don't need that. So you are, of course, all welcome to come up and look at these books. We'll open them for you. Um, we ask you, if you can stand it, to not touch them. We would be happy to turn pages for you. This is such a great turnout that we're not uh, quite prepared for um, everyone to handle these books in spite of what we just, every single one of us, just said today about touching the books. I encourage you all, though, to come back, to go to the fourth floor or to the Eccles Library, to look at these books in a, a slightly more sedate setting. Um, you then are welcome to sit in front of the books, to turn the pages, to feel the paper, to smell the paper. Um, and I also, for those of you who teach or have classes, I also encourage you to get in touch with us. We would love to introduce these books and others to your students. So, Lube is gonna stand up here with me and our presenters will be here. Um, we'd be happy to um, handle the books for you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.